Hello guys, hello friends, hello G's. It's your boy again, Fallen with a Star. So guys, today we are looking at enzymes. And one thing you have to know about enzymes is that they are being synthesized by the living cells to catalyze the biologically feasible reactions in our body. And already you guys know that the reactions, we have anabolic reactions and we have what? The catabolic reactions. These enzymes that we are going to talk about, mostly they are protein in nature, but they can be RNA in nature. For example, we have an enzyme called ribozyme. Hope you understand. We have four levels of proteins. Why am I talking about the four levels of proteins? Because enzymes are mostly protein in nature. And these proteins, as I said, we have four levels. We have the primary structure, which is being made up of amino acids being joined together by what peptic bonds. As you can see, these are the amino acids joined by what the peptic bonds. We have the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and we have the quaternary structure. Mostly proteins are functionable in the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. And enzymes are functionable because they catalyze biologically feasible reactions. So they are mostly being found in the tertiary structure or the quaternary structure. Not forgetting, enzymes are highly specific for the substrates they catalyze and also the reactions they catalyze. So if an enzyme is being made up of substrate A, it will catalyze only substrate A and will not catalyze substrate B. Hope you understand because they are highly what specific. Their specificity is because of this one thing they have called the active site. And this active site is like a pocket to which the substrate binds to for a product to be released. So the substrate will bind to this active site and the enzyme will work on it and the product will be released. The active site that I'm talking about is complementary in nature to the what to the substrate. It is complementary in nature to the substrate and it contains few amino acids like 2 to 4. 2 to 4 amino acids. But the most frequent amino acids being found at the active site is the amino acid called the serine. So the serine is the most frequent amino acid that you can find at the active site. And this is an exam's question. At first, we thought that the active site was rigid as stated according to the lock and key model. But later, we realized that the active side is not rigid, but rather it is flexible according to the induced fit model. At the active side, these amino acids, they have charges. And these amino acids, they have some are hydrophilic in nature and some are hydrophobic in nature. And because of this, they sometimes gives the enzyme some level of what? Stereospecificity, radiospecificity, and chemoselectivity. You can actually read on these things and know what they actually are. Enzymes actually remains unchanged in the overall process. So in the overall process where they are actually converting substrate to products, they actually remain unchanged. So you see that a substrate will bind to the active site of an enzyme and an enzyme substrate complex will be formed and the enzyme will work on the substrate and the product will be formed and we will get our enzyme back. We will get our enzyme back because enzymes actually remains unchanged in the what in the overall what process 
these enzymes that we are talking about they are heat labor meaning they are being denatured or destroyed by heat and they are also water soluble but when i say enzymes are heat labor it's not all enzymes we have this this enzyme called thermo enzymes they are actually resistant to heat so this is an enzymes question all enzymes are heat labor true or false is false because we have this thermo enzyme which is resistance to what to heat one thing is that some enzymes can act or work perfectly on their own but some also require boosters called what cofactors and these boosters called cofactors they can either be inorganic which is metal ions or organic which is what vitamins so the cofactors can be inorganic or what organic so those that require the inorganic which is the metal ions we call them metalloenzymes you understand i want to make a point here enzyme can be on their own and enzyme on their own they are called apoenzymes they are called what apoenzyme and enzymes combine to cofactors cofactors they are non-protein so enzymes combine to these cofactors and when enzyme bind to these cofactors we call them hollow enzymes and the bond between the enzyme and the cofactor can be a loose bond that's when they bind to organic cofactors or can be a tight bone that's when the enzyme binds to what the inorganic cofactors now let's look at the classification of enzymes enzymes are actually classified by international units of biochemistry into six classes and they are arranged from class one to class six so as you can see, we have the class 1, the class 2, the class 3, the class 4, class 5, and class 6. But in 2018, they actually introduced a seventh class called translocase or translocase. But now we will look at the six classes. The first class here is known as the oxidoreductase enzymes. The oxidoreductase enzymes. What do they do? They actually catalyze oxidation reduction reactions. When I say oxidation reactions, meaning that they either add an oxygen to a substrate or remove a hydrogen from a substrate. When I say reduction, it's either removal of oxygen or addition of hydrogen to a substrate. And an example of this enzyme the class 1 enzymes are alcohol hydro, uh, dehydrogenases. Alcohol dehydrogenases. Mostly these enzymes, they, are, they end with dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. Hope you understand. Alcohol dehydrogenase. Glucose dehydrogenase. You understand? And we have the second class, which is called the transferase enzymes. They actually catalyze the transfer of what? A functional group from one substrate to another substrate. So they can transfer either a metal functional group, a carboxyl functional group, or a phosphate functional group. An example of these enzymes, we have the kinases. We have the amino transferases and we have the what? The transmetallases. Hope you understand. Now we have the third class, which is the hydrolase. The hydrolase, they actually catalyze hydrolysis bonds. They catalyze hydrolysis bonds. That is, they cleave bonds and add water. They cleave bonds and add water so the difference between the third class which is hydrolysis and the fourth class which is lysis is that for the lysis they cleave bonds without adding what water and an example of lysis is what aldolysis and fumarases hope you understand now let's look at the fifth class the fifth class 
is called isomerases. For them, they catalyze intramolecular structure rearrangement. That is when you see that glucose can turn to a fructose because there is an intramolecular structure rearrangement. So example of such enzymes, we have the mutases and we have the epimerases. Hope you understand. Sometimes the enzymes can end with the name isomerases. Hope you understand. Now let's look at the seed class. The seed class is the ligases. For them, they catalyze the joining of what? Two molecules. And they will join these two molecules by using energy in the form of what? ATP. Example of such enzymes, we have the synthetase and we have the synthase. The difference between the synthetase and the synthase is that the synthetase requires ATP or uses ATP directly and the synthase doesn't use ATP directly. Hope you understand. Now, let's look at the mechanism of enzymes. How does enzymes actually work? Enzymes are able to accelerate chemical reactions because they are able to lower the activation energy and therefore they create an alternate pathway which is more faster. So you can see that this is the normal pathway which is longer but they decrease the activation energy and make the pathway shorter. They can also create an environment in which the transition state, the transition state is the enzyme substrate complex state. So they create an environment in which the transition state becomes stabilized. The transition state becomes stabilized and this helps them to accelerate chemical what, reactions. They can also reduce the reaction entropy change by what? By bringing the substrates together in a correct orientation to react because the substrates must be in a correct orientation to react for a product to be released. When they are not in a correct ori orientation, a product cannot be released. Hope you understand. Now, I've talked about cofactors. Now, let's look at the opposite of cofactors, which is what? Inhibitors. For the inhibitors, what they do is that they decrease the activity of what? Enzymes. And we have types of inhibitors. We have two main types. We have the reversible inhibitors and we have the irreversible inhibitors. For the reversible inhibitors, we have three main types. We have the competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, and uncompetitive inhibition. Why do we call this one competitive inhibition? Because these inhibitors actually look like the substrates they are analogs of the substrates and because they look like the substrate they compete with the substrate for the active sites on the enzyme you understand so they compete for the what for the uh, they compete with the substrate for the active site on the what on the enzyme hope you understand but this competitive inhibition can be overcome when you increase the concentration of the substrate, when you increase the concentration of the substrate, the substrate can remove the inhibitor from the enzyme. You understand? And they will rather bind to the active site. But when the concentration of the substrate is low, it will rather be the inhibitor winning to bind to the what? To the active site of what? Of the enzyme. Now we have non-competitive inhibition. For this one, they are non-competitive because they don't look like the substrate. And